Okay, good morning. So then uh, maybe we can start. So it's the uh, first time we have lecture so early. <laughs> I'm not such an early morning person, but anyway. So <coughs> now we were uh, aiming towards uh, the silo theorems, which will be the uh, what we end the part on group theory with. In the moment, we are still talking about operations on subsets. So, so that it was that uh, we have some group G which acts on S. So then it follows that G acts on the subsets of S. So on the set of subsets of S. And so if, um, so by just if U is a subset of S, we have uh, the action is by G U maps to G times U, which is just you know, the set of all products G times U. So this is the action of G on the element U with U in U. And we had uh, introduced the stabilizer GU, which was uh, the set of all elements in the group, which leave U fixed under this operation, so which means that U is mapped to itself, not that it's the identity on U. So it's the set of all G and G, such that GU is equal to U. And this is a subgroup of U. And so we finished by stating the following result is a proposition. So if G acts on a set S and U subset S is a subset as we are here, then uh, the stabilizer of U is equal to G if and only if uh, U is a union of G orbits on S. Okay, and so this was the last thing we said. Now we want to consider two special cases of such actions. Namely, in each case, uh, S is actually equal to G. We look at an action of, of G on itself. And uh, we want to see how it you know, acts on certain subsets of S, for instance, on subgroups. So the first case is uh, just the left translation. So we want now S is equal to G. And um, we want to use look at the action by left translation and the action by transposition. So first, let's look at the left translation. So proposition, let uh, G act on itself. by left translation. So I remind you that this just, just means we have a, so the action is just map from G times G to G, where you know, the, the operation of G on U, on, on G, well, maybe on A in G, is just the multiplication in the group. Okay, so in this case, uh, we take any subgroup of G, then the order of the stabilizer of U divides the order of, divides the number of elements of U. So maybe we assume also, uh, we assume that G is finite in for simplicity. <coughs> so then uh, the order of the stabilizer of U divides the number of elements of U. Yeah, no, it's a subgroup. I don't know whether actually 
need that. No, I don't think I need it. So I could also say, it's, yeah, it's I think okay even for a subset. I don't think I will need it in that case, but uh, any case. So, so this is a straightforward consequence of this result. So, so by this result here. So maybe I can call it proof. So by this proposition here, which I have restated here, uh, uh, <coughs> we have that uh, U is a union of G orbits for the left translation. No? No, no, no. Sorry. So, so I may be right. I write H to be GU. Okay. Now, if I look at the action of GU on U, then obviously, as GU is a stabilizer of U, it uh, fixes U. No? So, therefore, this result applies. So we have that um, uh, U is a union of H orbits on G. So we just restrict the left translation from G to H. No? Just uh, if we have a map from G times G to G, we have a map from H times G to G. And um, it is a, this result applies, and it's a union of orbits. But recall that uh, uh, <coughs> so for any element uh, Cx in G, we have that the map from H to uh, to the orbit of x, which just sends uh, uh, an element h here to h times x, is injective. Because you know, the, if we take the multiplication from the left, um, you know, it will always be. So it means. Um, that the number of elements in Hx is equal to the number of elements in H. But now, <coughs> so it means, so now U is a union of H orbits, you know, of a certain number of H orbits. Each of these H orbits has precisely as many elements as uh, the number of elements in H. So the number of elements is the sum of so and so many times the number of elements in H. So that means thus H divides number of elements in U. So it's basically a straightforward corollary of this. So <coughs> just for applications, um, you know, for instance, one special case is when, so this poses some restrictions on uh, how these uh, actions can be. So for instance, we have the following uh, easy remark. So, <coughs> you know, GU is a subgroup of G, no? The stabilizer is a subgroup of G. So we know that GU, the number of elements of GU, divides number of elements in G, because we know that the number of elements in a subgroup divides this. And now we also have, <coughs> so as GU is a subgroup, so if uh, the number of elements in U and the number of elements in G are relatively prime, and 
then it follows. <coughs> so that means they have no common divisor except for one. Then it follows that uh, the number of elements in GU must be number that divides both U and G. So it can only be one. So then GU must be equal to one. So by just counting the number of elements in the set, we can see that sometimes the stabilizer must be trivial. So um, anyway, so this is not very, <laughs> these are all not very exciting results, but they are I mean, used. And now uh, the other uh, case we want to look at is the uh, operation of uh, G on itself by conjugation. So G is still a finite group. Um, and uh, we want now to actually use the conjugation on subgroups. So, so the operation by conjugation. So in this case, we let, uh, we let uh, uh, so H be a subgroup of G. Well, this um, for every element G in G, we can define the conjugate subgroup, you know, by just conjugating every element with G. So we have the, the conjugate subgroup I write it uh, G H G to the minus one, which is just some sense shorthand for doing this for every element. So this is the set of all G H G to the minus one, where H is an H. And it's uh, straightforward to see that this is a subgroup. of G. Oh, that's basically obvious. <coughs> and um, it's also easy that uh, this conjugation defines an operation of G on the set of subgroups of G. So the conjugation so so from G to the subgroups of G to the subgroups of G, which sends uh, element G and H to G, H, G to the minus 1, is an operation an action of G on the set of subgroups. Now, this is kind of clear that if you take the identity element, it leaves this thing fixed. And if you take the uh, composition of two elements, then obviously you just compose here. And this will be the same as doing it twice for the two different elements. So by definition, this is an operation. So I just want to make. Uh, so now again, we want to say what the stabilizer is. So the stabilizer of an element H, so of such a group H, is obviously the set of all uh, G which map uh, H to itself under conjugation. So the stabilizer for this action conjugation action hmm. so is called the normalizer of H 
also denoted n of h, and so by definition, it is the set of all g and g, such that g h g to the minus 1 is equal to h. Just a couple of remarks about this. So <clears throat> we have kind of seen this before. You know, this says the same as that gh is equal to hg, which is the same as that for every h in h, or, you know, so this condition says that for every h in h, gh, g to the minus 1, is an element in H. So we know that the condition to be a normal subgroup is precisely that this is true for all G in G. So by definition, we have that the normalizer of H is equal to G if and only if H is a normal subgroup. And uh, I mean, again, it's obvious that n of h is, so it's easy to see that n of h is a subgroup. Oh, easy, n of h is a subgroup. Ah, now the question is whether I made this an exercise. Anyway, <clears throat> OK. And so, <clears throat> but. Um, Anyway, maybe I should, uh, but I actually want to use this. So, uh, so we, we have seen it's easy that n of h is a subgroup of G. And it's also easy to see that h is a subgroup of n of h. Because obviously, uh, it certainly is a subset. It is also easily. I mean, and it's a group. So, uh, so therefore, it follows that the number of elements, you know, if we are in the situation where the group are, are finite, as we have made the assumption here, so we know that the number of elements of H divides the number of elements of N of H, and N of the number of elements in N of H divides the number of elements in G. Okay, so the order of H divides that of N of H, and the order of N of H divides that of G. Okay, this is very And I can also maybe, as another simple remark, so um, let, uh, say, C be the number of different uh, conjugate subgroups to H. So by which I mean these are the different subgroups of G, which are conjugate to H. For instance, <coughs> if uh, uh, H is a normal subgroup, we see that uh, if you make the conjugation, you get it back. So in this case, C would be 1. Um, then we find by the orbit orbits stabilizer theorem So this is the same. The different conjugate subgroups is just the, the number of elements in the orbit of H you know, under the conjugation action. So by the orbit stabilizer theorem, we get that the number of elements in G is equal to the number of elements in the stabilizer times the number of elements in the orbit. OK, so this was. Uh, what I wanted to say about this. So as you see, there's no 
no real result and nothing particularly interesting here. The point is that we want to use these uh, as, uh, you know, as tools in what we want to do. And now we want to uh, start talking about the silo theorems. <coughs> so, So these are um, <coughs> so this will be somehow the most uh, advanced result we do about groups in the in this uh, <coughs> course. Afterwards, we go to rings and fields. Um, so what is it about? So <coughs> so so these describe. Uh, uh, subgroups so H in G where G is a finite group which have the property that the number of elements in H is a power of a prime So, um, and in particular, they will describe it for the maximal. So, we know if uh, H is a subgroup of G, then the number of elements, so the order of H divides the order of G. So if you have a subgroup, then the number of elements of the subgroup must be a divisor of the number of elements in the group. Um, <coughs> but it is not true that for every divisor of the number of elements of G, there is necessarily a subgroup. It's actually difficult to decide for which divisor there will be a subgroup. And so one of the things, <coughs> so, um, but uh, the converse is not true. So uh, it's not not all. Um, it's, it's difficult to decide. For which divisors of of G, there is a subgroup with uh, this divisor as number of elements. So um, there's, so the first Silo theorem gives us kind of a very partial converse, namely it tells us the following. So, so the first Namely, it says that if we write, uh, so if P is a prime, P is a pr if so for P a prime number, and if we write the number of elements of G as uh, P to the M times, what do I want? Um, times s, so maybe I write r, where p does not divide, so we take the maximal power of p, which divides the number of elements of g, then there's always one subgroup 
uh, of uh, G, which has P to the M elements. So we don't know it for all divisors, but if we take the maximal power of a prime number which divides G, there will always be such a subgroup. And such a subgroup will be called a silo P group. Subgroup. Um, <clears throat> and then the other two silo theorems tell us a little bit more about the silo P groups and about other uh, P subgroups of G. So a P, sub, a P group is a group whose number of elements is the power of, of the prime P. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so it turns out that You know, this, these groups tell us quite a lot about, these subgroups tell us quite a lot about the group G. For instance, one finds out that um, one gets a lot of restrictions from these theorems, in particular also the first Zillow theorem, about uh, what the groups of, with a certain number of elements is, are. So we will, as applications uh, of the Zillo theorems, uh, give... Uh, some kind of partial classification of, uh, of groups of certain small orders. So we will say for certain numbers what precisely the groups are uh, that uh, uh, up to isomorphism, which uh, have so many elements. And uh, so it's not so clear from the statement that this is so powerful, but we will see. <coughs> okay, so maybe now I, so after this kind of introduction, I will try to uh, do things precisely. Um, <clears throat> so we will first we will first state the silo theorems. I mean, first the first we will first state the first silo theorem, then give some applications, then state the other silo theorems, and maybe also give an application, and then we will in the end prove the silo theorems. So in the in the following. We want that let G be a finite group. And we always write, so let P be a prime, a prime number. And we write uh, the number of elements in G as p to the m times r, where m is a non-negative integer, and p does not divide r, okay, as I have stated here. And now some definitions. So first, I think I already, so a group H is called a, a, a P group, so P is still our prime number, if uh, the number of elements is equal to P to the K, uh, for some k bigger than zero. So the p groups are the groups which have as number of elements a power of a prime. Now we are interested in, in particular p subgroups of our group, namely these p silo groups. So a subgroup uh, h of our 
finite group G is called a piece pseudo subgroup if well so it's a subgroup if the number of elements is the maximal possible so for a p group So if the number of elements is the highest power of P that divides G. So if, if it's, you know, so it is a P group and it has the maximum number of elements for P group contained in G. And the first uh, pseudo theorems, as I, pseudo theorem, as I said, is that such groups always exist. So if I have a group which I can write in such a way, actually, I want that it's actually divisible by P, <laughs> um, then uh, there is a P0 subgroup. So theorem. This is uh, usually called the first Silo theorem. So, <clears throat> I mean, in the setup I have here, so G is equal number of elements in G is P to the M times R. So we have, there is a, a P Silo subgroup. of G. So there's at least one such uh, subgroup. Okay. So this is the first statement. It's not a power and not at all obvious why should this should be true. But anyway, that's the way it is. <coughs> we will see later uh, how one can prove it. First, we do a uh, Corollary, which is, um, I think, usually called uh, Cauchy's theorem. So, if a prime p, if a prime number divides the number of elements in a group G, Uh, then uh, there is an element in G which uh, has order P. order precisely p. So it means that if I multiply x with itself p times, I get 1. And if I take any smaller power of x, I don't get 1. OK, so this is the first statement. So <coughs> let's see. So we want to prove this as a corollary to the Silo theorem. <laughs> So we take H in G is silo, a P silo subgroup. So by the theorem, we have such a thing. <coughs> and we want to find action element in H, which has this order, which is somehow much easier. So let x, well, maybe I call it y, in H be an element different from 1, from the neutral element. So 
So then y will, uh, so the, sub, the subgroup generated by y will be a subgroup. And um, so the number of elements in the subgroup will have to divide uh, this, the number of elements in H. No? So, so maybe I write uh, that the number of elements in H is equal to P to the M. So we have that, um, so, so if I look at the subgroup generated by Y, uh, this has uh, the order of Y elements. Oh, we know that uh, the subgroup is just, con just consists of 1, y squared, and so on, until y to the order of y minus 1. <coughs> and uh, we know that uh, the number of, and, and therefore, the order of y divides the number of elements in H, because y is a subgroup of H. And so, uh, the order of y is equal to p to the k for some number k between 1 and m. No? Because uh, y is different from 1, so it's the order of y is not 0, is not is not 1. And uh, <coughs> on the other hand, you know, it's a subgroup of this thing, so it's at least at most that. OK. Whatever the k is, we can take, uh, we can put x equal to y to the p to the k minus 1. So then we know that this is not equal to 1, obviously, because the order of y is p to the k. But if we take uh, y, if we take x to the p, this is y to the p to the k minus 1 to the p, so it means we multiply this, so this is equal to y to the p to the k, which is equal to 1. So we see that the order of x is p. Okay, so we have found an element of order p, which is just this. We take any non-zero element of the non-neutral uh, element of the p zero subgroup and take it to the appropriate pi power, then it has order p. Okay. Now we want to give some more applications. So I'm, I will slightly differ from the from the notes because I have a few more applications than are in the notes. I might uh, maybe give you some updated version of the notes if I find the time to, I mean, when I find the time to uh, put it in the notes. So I want to give some first applications. So first, as a preparation for that, I want to briefly talk about the direct product of groups. I think I very briefly introduced it in the beginning. Now I have to say a little bit more. So definition let uh, H and K be groups. So the product um, H times K 
is, um, you know, as a group, is uh, of H and K, is as a set just the product. So H times K is just the set of all H K such that H is in H and um, K is in K. Okay, so the set of all pairs, that's clear. The uh, multiplication is component wise. So multiplication, so this is a group. So the multiplication, so if I have H1, K1 times H2, K2, obviously this is done component wise, so this is H1. H2, uh, K1, H2, K2. Um, the neutral element is just having the identity on both sides. So, so the neutral element is uh, 1, 1. And the inverse of an element uh, H, K will just be component-wise the inverse. And obviously, you can immediately check that this works. <coughs> also, it's uh, really standard. So now we want to characterize, you know, find a criterion for a group to be isomorphic to the product of two subgroups. So oh, I call this theorem, it's maybe a bit exaggerated, so let G be a group. H and K subgroups. of G, and we assume three properties. First, that G is equal to a kind of the product of them. So what I mean is, uh, if I take the set of all products of an element of H and an element of K, then I get in this way all elements in G, okay? So I can reach every element in G as a product of one element in the subgroup H and one element in the subgroup K. Second statement is that these are actually not just subgroups, but they are normal subgroup. And the third one is that they don't intersect. If I take H intersected K, obviously as they are H and K are both subgroups, they have to could contain the neutral element of G, but they claim, they, they, we assume that they only contain, their only common element is the neutral element. So the kind of products of these elements give everything and they intersect as little as possible. And then the claim is, then G is isomorphic to H times K. Okay, so this is not an application of the pseudo theorem. This is uh, something we want to use for the applications. It's just something. Which one? Yeah, I would think so. Why? Uh, did I make, is there a misprint? Ah, yeah, there's a misprint. Uh, yeah, you're right. I'm, there's a misprint, obviously. I don't know. How did I do that? Yeah, obviously, it has to be component. I said it's component-wise. So it is co correct in the sense that uh, what I meant is correct.
but it's not correct what I wrote. Okay, so component minus means wise means obviously the same component is multiplied. But anyway, this the rest is correct. Yeah. No. So there are always, you know, I'm, I will always make some misprints. Obviously, I can always claim I just do this to check whether you pay attention. <laughs> but, uh, okay, so let's try to prove that. So the question is, Yeah, maybe I would try to so proof. So there, you know, there's an obvious map from H times K to G just by sending an element H in H and K in K to their product. So we have a map. Um, Maybe I call it phi or whatever. Theta from H times K to G, which sends element H and K to H times K. Okay? So there's obviously such a map. <coughs> um, you know, here just a product in the group G. So we want to show. This is an isomorphism. So it's, we want to show it's both bijective and it's a group homomorphism. So first, one has to look at the first one here. The first statement just says this map is surjective. No, that's what it says. No, it says that every element in G can be written as a product of an element H times K, so which means precisely it is in the image of the map. So one says theta is surjective. That's certainly a good start. Now, um, We want to show it is also, yeah, let's, um, let me see. Yeah, we want to show maybe it's a homomorphism. So let us take, so if you have an element H, is it this one? Yeah. So let an, we take an element H in H and an element K in K. And we want to, we look at this expression, H to the minus 1, K to the minus 1. H, K. Want to know what that? What? Yeah. Well, that's what I want to see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is that is the idea. But I I have to uh, explain this also to the others. So we can write this as H to the minus one, K to the minus one, H, K. Now, uh, H was a normal subgroup. So if I do this, this is also an element in H. Because uh, H is normal. So I multiply with an element in H. So this is an element in H. And now, obviously, you can do it the other way around, as he also uh, observed. So we have H to the minus. This is also equal to. Uh, h to the minus 1, k to the minus 1, h, k. 
And by the same argument, this is you know the conjugation of this element with an element in H. So this is also an element in K. And so the whole thing is an element in K. So we find that this element, uh, as he said, is an element in H and in K. So it means H to the minus 1, K to the minus 1, HK is an element in H intersected K. But by uh, this statement number 3, this says it is the identity element. Now, <coughs> What does it tell us? We can now bring these to the other side. So we multiply by H, we multiply by K. So it follows. So on this side, we multiply by H, and on this side, we multiply, and then afterwards by K. So this means that HK is equal to KH. So we have found that every element of H commutes with every element of K, which is certainly a good thing to know. And that immediately shows us what yeah that this is a home office <laughs> so I'm yeah but again I will write it down so if we now we take uh, k1 uh, h1 h2 in h and k1, k2, in, so this was h in k. And then we can ask ourselves, so if we take phi, or no, it was theta, no? Theta of, um, uh, say, how do you want it? Yeah, say, which way around is it better? Yeah, maybe it was this. Uh, H1, K1 uh, times theta of H2, K2. OK, we have to see that this is the same as theta of the product. So what is it? So this is here. This is H1, K1 times H2, K2. But now we know that um, every element of H commutes with n every element of K. So therefore, this is the same as H1, H2, K1, K2. But according to our definition of theta, this is just equal to theta of H1, H2, K1, K2. So which precisely means that this is a homomorphism. And finally, in order to see that it's an isomorphism, we have to see that the kernel is Once even. Okay. What? Once okay. Um, we are saying that theta is subjective yeah. by definition. And we know that the guy in P and HK have the same modulus. Ah, OK. So, so that um, you don't need to prove that it's a modulus. That, uh, that is indeed true. But uh, you know, OK, it's true that if you have a bijective, if you have a Subjective map from a finite set or onto a finite set with the same number of elements, then so they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but did we? I mean, um, well, a priori, I'm not quite sure whether we have completely seen that the number of elements in G, you know, when at least it's not completely evident that the number of elements in G is the product. No, that it's the num that it's the product. I mean, you have to see that all these elements are different. It's maybe kind of obvious, but you know, still we might. Uh, uh, want to give an argument. So <clears throat> so then finally, to see uh, that theta is an isomorphism, we have to see that the kernel of theta is equal to the neutral element. So it's equal to 1. One. Well, so 
let uh, h k be an element in the kernel of theta. So that means h times k is equal to 1. So <clears throat> in other words, I can multiply by h to the minus 1. So we have k is equal to h to the minus 1. No? So <clears throat> now that means k is an element in k, but it's also equal to h to the minus 1, which is an element in h. So this is an element in h intersected k equal to 1. So that means uh, k is equal to 1. And as it is equal to h to the minus 1, it's also h is also equal to 1, 1. And so the map is injective. So now we want to briefly apply this to uh, cyclic groups. So classify and say something about that. So the first just recall. So recall a group is cyclic, so a finite group, well, whatever. If um, uh, G is equal to A for, so maybe I call the group H for some A in H. And so, so if uh, H is um, cyclic of order, uh, say, M, we know, we have seen, that uh, H is isomorphic to just the group, uh, for instance, Z mod M Z. No? So the integers from, uh, you can either view this as the integers from 0 to m minus 1, where the addition would be given by the, uh, by adding them and taking the rest by division by m. <coughs> anyway, so <coughs> corollary. So we assume, assume the numbers n and m are some positive integers, and n and m are relatively prime. So that means they have no common divisor. So the only common, uh, the only integer which divide, positive integer which divides both of them is one. Then we have that if I take the group C mod uh, N M C, this is isomorphic to Z N Z mod N Z times Z mod M Z. Okay. Okay. So I mean, recall that this 
as a set. This is just a set of classes 0, 1, until m minus 1 with the addition. Um, <coughs> so proof. So <coughs> if we take uh, the subgroup generated by the number n, so so the, the element n has order m in z mod n m z and m has order n in z mod n m z no because it's just you add them and then until you add until you get to n times m z so we have um, therefore that we have two subgroups we have we have a subgroup so z mod n m z has a subgroup of order n and the subgroup of order m, namely the ones generated by these elements. Um, and the intersection of these two subgroups consists just at, of the element 0 in this group, no? because uh, you can just see. But anyway, it's uh, so, and uh, uh, so their intersection is 0, which is the neutral element. And obviously, they are normal subgroups because this group is commutative. So by this uh, theorem, I just wiped out it follows that uh, z mod n m z is isomorphic to z mod n z times z mod m z. So we see in this case, uh, if these two numbers are relatively prime, you can uh, such a product is always isomorphic to the thing with the product. Okay. What do I want to do? Now we also want to see how is it if instead we take uh, 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 <coughs> Yeah. So uh, now, as a first step, we want to kind of classify the groups whose order is the square of a prime number. They are somehow of this form. So this is now, now we are using the Silo theorem, so corollary. Let P be a prime. And um, G, a group of order P squared. What time is it actually? Uh, then either uh, G is isomorphic to Z mod p squared z, or g is isomorphic to z mod p z times z mod p z. Note that uh, the previous theorem doesn't apply here because obviously uh, p, p and p is not relatively prime. So these are actually turn out to be not isomorphic. OK, so. So the, this kind of the first statement is that if we have a group such that the number of elements is the square of a prime number, then there are only these two possibilities. 
So <coughs> maybe I can. You maybe remember that we proved that uh, a group whose number of elements is a square of a prime is commutative. So we showed. Okay, so we already know quite a lot. <coughs> so now we use this corollary to the, so which was uh, Cauchy's theorem, which said that uh, if, um, so G is a group whose number of elements is the square of a, so is a, is a power of a prime number. So in particular, the number of elements is divisible by this power of this prime number. So then G contains an element of order P. So by Cauchy's theorem, G contains an element, how do you want to call it? A of order P. So, so we let, uh, say, H be the subgroup generated by this element A. So this is a subgroup with P elements. Now we take any element B, which, does, which lies in G, but not in H. Okay. And we call H prime the subgroup generated by B. Well, there are two possibilities. Either the subgroup is the whole of G, or it isn't. No? What? B is an element of G minus H. Minus H. Minus H. Yeah. So this is not, um, I mean, at least for me, the notation of uh, okay. one set minus another is like this. You could sometimes, it's also used as dividing by an action from the other side, but I never use this notation. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's this. I mean, but if you're more familiar with it, you can say this, but this also I find confusing. So whatever you write is confusing. It just means it's an element of G, which is not an element of H. And this, for me, is my standard notation. Um, <coughs> So, either we have that H prime is equal to G, and then obviously G is isomorphic to Zp squared because it's cyclic, Z mod P squared Z, because, you know, we know that cyclic groups are just of this, you know, the, uh, or, um, you know, H prime is not. Is, I mean, it's a strong subset. I mean, a, a strict subset of, uh, of G. So, <clears throat> well, the number of elements in H prime is a divisor of P. So if we, so if uh, H, the number of elements, if H prime is different from G, uh, then it follows that the number of elements in H prime is equal to P. Because it must be divisor of P, it cannot be P squared, because otherwise it would be the whole of G, and it cannot be 1, because you know, this is an element which does, the element B lie, does not lie in, in H, and therefore it's not equal to 1. Okay. <coughs> and uh, obviously H prime is cyclic because it's, um, uh, well, it was defined as a cyclic group. So, H intersected H prime uh, is a subgroup of H. 
composite H. Yeah. Of H and its uh, <coughs> and again, it's uh, therefore its number of elements is a divisor of P. So the number of H intersected H prime is a divisor of the number of elements in H or in H prime, which is P. And uh, as uh, I here from behind, uh, you know, it cannot be that H intersected H prime is equal, it has P elements because otherwise H would have to be equal to H prime, which is impossible by our assumption. So, and uh, H intersected H prime is different from H or from H prime because uh, otherwise would have that h is equal to h prime, which uh, contradicts our assumption that uh, this uh, is generated by this element b, which does not lie in h. So therefore, it follows that the number of elements, uh, so, <coughs> so it must be a strict subset. So the number of elements in this intersection is smaller than p. So it can only be 1. And so if the subgroup has only one element, it means that this is equal to the neutral element in the group. So we find <coughs> that, uh, again, we have two uh, subgroups. So our group is commutative. So H and H prime, H prime are normal subgroups. Um, we can easily see that uh, h times h prime is equal to our group G. Maybe I can leave that to you, but it follows quite easily. <coughs> and the intersection h intersected h prime is equal to the neutral element. So it follows that uh, G is equal to the product. And uh, obviously, both. Um, H and H prime were cyclic groups with P elements. So this is uh, just isomorphic to Z mod PZ times Z mod PZ. OK. How much time? Yeah, <clears throat> now we want to come to a slightly <clears throat> more uh, difficult result. So remember that I had uh, introduced the dihedral group. As an example, let me briefly recall it. So I had described it as the set of uh, symmetries by reflections and rotations of an n-gon. So if I have d2n, so that here we move d2n to dn. And uh, what I had described is it's a group. So, so D to N, Dn is a group generated by two elements, by elements A and B, with the property that, which one was it? That A to the N is equal to one b squared is equal to 1 in the group, and uh, b a b, or if you want b a b to the minus 1, is equal to a to the minus 1. And um, we also want that uh, such that, so with 
two n elements. So I mean, obviously, we could have a group with um, one element which has this property a and b is equal to one and uh, one to the you know, but we have this. <coughs> so and uh, we had seen that this exists as these uh, rotations and reflections of uh, an n gone, and we in fact can say what the elements are. The elements are so as a set d to the n was equal to the set of all a to the i, b to the j, such that um, uh, 0 is smaller or equal to i is smaller than n, and 0 is smaller or equal to j is smaller than 2. You can see that these are precisely 2n elements, and you, what? Yeah, yeah, I said it, I think, but I didn't write it. Um, <coughs> so you can see that these are precisely two n elements. And you can see that uh, if you think of it a little bit, that any product in the A's and B's, you can bring into this form by applying these two relations. Whenever you have a power of A bigger than n, you can reduce it. And whenever you have a power of B bigger than 1, you can make it at most 1. And you can comm commute the A's. You, if, if you have a, an A and B's on two sides, you can bring it on the other side by using this relation. And so in the end, you can bring it into this form. I mean, there's, you can imagine that. <coughs> so this is this group. And now um, I want to claim, uh, I want to classify a large number of finite groups. <coughs> This is again an application of Silo theorems. So, theorem. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. It doesn't make sense to start with the proof. I will have to see what I do. <coughs> so, let P be a prime. Uh, let G be a group of order. Um, 2p, so twice uh, a prime, uh, then either g is cyclic, so isomorphic to z modulo 2pz, or g is isomorphic to the hedra group dp. Okay, so there are only two possibilities for the isomorphism type of a group with 2p elements. So it doesn't make sense to me to try to, uh, to give the proof. I will do it next time. Maybe we can just see for instance, uh, that the things we already know tell us quite a lot about groups of small order. So I can make a little table. So if we look at uh, the number of elements of G and um, on the other hand, we look at the isomorphism classes. the group G. So what up to isomorphism, how many, what are the different groups? So if the group G has one element, it's just one. So that's not very exciting. If uh, the number of elements in a group is a prime number, we know it's cyclic. So it's isomorphic to Z mod, in this case, 2Z. So it's same here. What? So isomorphism class. So I abbreviate it nastily. So if 4, so 4 is the square of a prime number. So we know there are two possibilities. It can be z mod 4z or uh, z mod 2z 
times z mod 2z. And these are actually also not isomorphic, as you can easily see, because this contains an element of order 4, and this doesn't. Then 5 is again a prime number. Now 6 is twice the prime number. So there are two possibilities. It can either be equal to uh, the cyclic group, or it can be equal to the group D3. So note that <coughs> uh, we also know some other groups of order 6. So one group of order 6 that we know is the symmetric group in, in three letters. But now we know the symmetric group in three letters is not, is not commutative, and this one is. So we know that this is actually isomorphic to S3. And then group with seven elements. Yeah, OK. If I define D3 as a, sub, uh, as a subgroup, the way I defined S3, as a, a, a D3 as a subgroup of, a, a, so if I define Dn as a subgroup of Sn, they are equal. Yeah. If I look at this abstract thing here, obviously they are isomorphic, but whatever. And then 7, it's Z mod 7Z. If we have 8, well, yeah, we know some. Uh, we have uh, Z mod 8Z. We have um, um, z mod 4z times z mod 2z, and we have z mod 2z uh, three times. But, uh, you know, we don't have any theorem about this. I mean, we don't have a theorem which classifies the third for a third power of a prime number what the numbers is, so there might be more, and there, you know. So we don't know, so there might be more, and there are more and we don't know them. Certainly there, there are some non-commutative groups, but uh, we haven't understood them. And then 9 and 10 we still know. So just do up to, up to 10. So for 9, we have z mod 9z and uh, z mod 3z squared, uh, so times itself. And for 10, we have z mod 10z, and we have d5, so which are, in each case, the complete classification. So for instance, we see that with a few things we have proven so far, except that we didn't yet prove this, um, we already have classified, except for the number 8, all groups of order up to 10. And you know, it goes a bit further, 11, well, 12 is not so nice, and, <laughs> and then, yeah. anyway. OK, so maybe that's, uh, uh, that's enough now. So we meet again on Friday, I think. Oh.